It is a great pleasure for me, um, a true privilege to introduce my friend, former ambassador to Germany, our leader at Dayton, one of the great diplomats of the 20th century, Ambassador Richard Holbrook, recipient of the 2005 Dayton Peace Prize. Saturday, November 18th, 1995, from a book I hope you'll all buy, if you haven't already. <clears throat> Negotiations, this is 10 years ago tomorrow, of course. Negotiations have a certain pathology, a kind of life cycle, almost like living organisms. At a certain point, which one might not recognize until later, the focus and momentum needed to get an agreement can disappear. Something can happen to break our single-minded commitment. Either endless squabbles over small details would now replace the larger search for peace, or the Europeans would leave, publicly signaling an impending failure. We worried that if we were still at Wright-Patterson over the Thanksgiving holiday, only a few days away, it would create the impression we had stayed too long and accomplished too little. Don Carrick, the general who was the White House representative, was bleak in his daily report to President Clinton. Endgame personal dynamics is taking a downward spiral. Milosevic and the Bosnian Serbs are never seen together. They rarely speak. Izabegovic, Mohamed Sacherbe, Haris Silajdic, continue to amaze all of us with their desire to torpedo one another and perhaps a peace agreement. So that's where we were 10, ten years ago today. And yet we stand here tonight, we sit here tonight with this extraordinary gathering in this city. And I cannot thank you enough for the honor you pay me and uh, what you've done to make this event possible. And I don't just mean the event here tonight, I mean the agreement itself. So before I talk about the Dayton Peace Agreement, I want to talk about Dayton, the city. I want to thank uh, the mayor and the mayor of Sarajevo, both of whom are here with us tonight. And I also want to acknowledge Oscar Bunschaff and Doris Ponitz and Hans Chuden and Charles and Ann Sims for their enormous contributions. I also want to say a word about my friend Bruce Hitchner. It is, it is true, it is literally true, and it must be acknowledged that if Bruce uh, were not part of this process, if he hadn't energized this process early on when he was worth at the University of Dayton and continuing his efforts from Tufts, uh, this event would not have taken place. So, Bruce, uh, I congratulate you for your role as well. <laughs> Dayton was, as Doris said, something of an accident, but not entirely. Uh, of course, I had never been to Dayton before I came here on, on October 31st, 1995. But we knew certain things. I had said from the beginning that I would never go to a city like Geneva, the ultimate symbol of failed diplomatic missions, a place where people are cynical, cold bureaucrats, and everything leaks to the press and to each other. I had simply told the White House as the shuttle progressed that we wouldn't go to Geneva. Most of the people in the White House and in the State Department wanted this negotiation to take place in Europe. 
It's very important because so many of you in this room are students of uh, diplomacy. Uh, it's very important to understand what had happened here. The war was so terrible. It was tearing Europe apart. American diplomacy under both the Bush and Clinton administrations had been such a failure. European diplomacy had been such a failure, despite the efforts of people like Wolfgang Ischinger, and I'll get to his role in a minute, that uh, there was a feeling, uh, despite the fact that the shuttle was beginning to define the issues, lower the differences, we'd already gotten a ceasefire, uh, we had bombed and stopped the bombing, there was a feeling that um, we took too big a risk holding on American soil. I took the opposite position. We were totally invested and in controlling the negotiation, controlling the site, controlling the agenda uh, was absolutely essential to maximize our chances for success. And nine of the ten people on the National Security Council opposed this position, including the Secretary of State. But uh, to Warren Christopher's credit, even though he opposed holding in the U.S., he said he would back the negotiator. And he switched. Al Gore supported me from the beginning. And President Clinton said, let's do it in the U.S. And then we started looking for a site. Camp David itself, the site of the most famous and most successful negotiation in the last 30 years, the 1978 negotiation that President Carter did between Menachem Begin and, um, and, and um, Anwar Sadat, was simply not big enough. We have here in the room today a veteran of the Camp David Accord and a former Assistant Secretary colleague of mine in the State Department, Hal Saunders, and I consulted him at length uh, on Camp David. It just wasn't big enough. We had 800 people in the end at Wright Pat. They had about 50 maximum at Camp David. And we had three major national delegations, Bosnian, Croat, and Serb, uh, plus the Europeans. Uh, so it was a very different and much more complicated negotiation. So with Camp David out, we looked everywhere. We looked at Newport. Uh, Senator Pell said, why don't you use the breakers at Newport? So we looked at that. It was kind of cute, but not quite right. <laughs> we looked at Pacantico, the Rockefeller estate, which was a wonderful site. And we could have sealed it off, but we didn't have enough bedrooms. And finally, my assistant, uh, Rosemary Pauley, went out around the country looking. We wanted something fairly close to Washington, but not too close, away from the press, but accessible so we could fly senior officials out here as required. And we had no idea what we were getting in for. And she came back and said, it's Wright Patterson Air Base. So we came out here. The Air Force uh, commanders did a wonderful job of fixing up the place. Um, and um, bec uh, they, they used the, of course, perfect military story. Once we were coming, they used our presence to do things they always wanted to do, but didn't have money. They spent a couple hundred thousand dollars to upgrade stuff, blaming it on us, which was great, but then they tried to send us the bill later. That we wouldn't agree to. So here we came to Dayton. And um, although one of my close friends, whose aunt is in the room tonight, Strobe Talbot, then Deputy Secretary of State, was from Dayton, I'd never been out here. And um, I, every time I've been to Dayton, I usually start by saying, would all those people in the audience who are not relatives of Strobe Talbot raise their hands? Because <laughs> everybody seems to be his relative. So we, uh, we came out here. It was wonderful. The Air Force did a fantastic job. They constructed barbed wire fences. They gave us security within security. They did everything you could ever want. There could not be, I'm sure Wolfgang Isching would agree, it's not possible to conceive of better negotiating situation. Not possible. And if you compare it to the shambles of the 1999 negotiations at the Chateau of Rambouillet outside Paris, which I think you were also involved in, where the French trying to match Dayton created a situation where the press was wandering around the courtyard with the Secretary of State and the Albanians and you could never get things going. You can see the value of a site that works. That's all clear and those of your students of the negotiation should consider the physical attributes of negotiations matter. But what none of us expected 
was the city, the people. They were peace vigils. They were extraordinary manifestations of support. Uh, people formed a human link around the base. Some of you are probably here tonight. What, you didn't have enough people to quite surround it because it was about, I don't know, eight or 10,000 acres, but you did a pretty good job. Uh, every time we left the base, there were people with signs praying. People put candles in the windows. When we went to uh, restaurants in town, um, L'Auberge was the one we went to the most often. Um, well, it was a pretty good restaurant. <laughs> uh, we uh, people would congratulate us. I walked into a restaurant once with Warren Christopher in town, and people stood and applauded him. Um, as I wrote here in the book, uh, Daytonians were proud to be part of history. Large signs at the commercial airports hailed Dayton as the temporary center of international peace. When we ventured into a restaurant, people uh, crowded around saying they were praying for us. Families on the airbase placed candles of peace. A second point, Ohio's famous ethnic diversity was also on display. None of this, as Doris said, none of this was intended. All of it had a tremendous additional value. We did everything possible to emphasize the fact that in the American heartland here in Ohio, people from every part of southeastern Europe lived together in peace. Their competition restricted to softball games, church rivalries, and the occasional barroom fight. Actually, I was told it was every Saturday night, but I didn't put that in. Once, as Milosevic and I were taking a walk, about 100 Albanian Americans came to the outer fence of Wright-Patterson with megaphones to plead the case for Kosovo. I suggested we walk over to chat with them, but Milosevic refused, saying testily they were obviously being paid by a foreign power. And Kosovo was an internal problem, a position with which I strongly disagreed. Of course, I wrote this book before Kosovo triggered the events that led to the second bombing, the liberation of Kosovo, and Milosevic's incarceration a year later in, in The Hague. So that was Dayton to us, an extraordinary place, a place which to me uh, is just, uh, just uh, for me, my second favorite city in the U.S. after my hometown of New York. Um, there's no way this could have happened if it was in Geneva or Washington or some jaded city. And I thank you all enormously. And so I want to say in accepting this tremendous award tonight, that I had come here uh, intending to give the full amount to some refugee organizations which had taken me to Bosnia for the first time in 1991-92. But tonight I, I uh, met Ralph Dull and he told me about the International, the Dayton International Peace Museum. So I want to change this a bit and, and offer Ralph, who doesn't know what I'm going to say, I want to give a, a portion of, the, of this award to this great museum. <laughs> Ralph, where are you? What? Your decision, Bruce, Ralph, the mayor, the citizens of Dayton, to keep the spirit of Dayton alive. Doris said that they researched and found that no other city had ever done this after a peace agreement. I think that's probably right, I have the same impression, is fantastic. And to me, coming from, uh, well, New York is a bit different, but, but, and I live in New York, but Washington is a cynical town, it really is. And, uh, and uh, in the worst sense of the word, and I don't just mean the stuff you hear on television, I mean the attitudes of people in Washington. I, I don't feel comfortable there, even though it's where I do the work that I care about most. That's why when I'm not in the government, Kati and I tend to live, try to live in New York, which is a much friendlier town. But the cynicism is in such contrast, and every time I come out here, this is my fifth trip in the last 10 years, uh, it just is inspiring, and I, I go back home and try to tell people about it. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart, and I congratulate Farida Masanovic also for sharing the evening with me. Congratulations. Now, Dayton itself. 
10 years ago we ended the war. If you go back and read the press that took place around November 21st and afterwards, you will be astonished. Without, with almost no exception, people predicted that we were partitioning Bosnia into two separate countries, which didn't happen. It is divided, and I'm not happy about that, and I'll get back in a moment to, what, to, to the issue. You will read that there will be heavy American casualties. Our own Secretary of Defense, Bill Perry, said that publicly. Body bags were prepared at the Ramstein Air Base at Frankfurt to receive the bodies. You will read that it was the 36th peace ceasefire agreement and the first 35 had failed. You will read that 70% of the American public in poll after poll opposed President Clinton's courageous decision to send 20,000 American troops to Bosnia as part of a 60,000 troop NATO deployment because of course everyone expected casualties. Uh, you will read uh, most distinguished people in American public life including uh, Henry Kissinger who was then as now probably the most respected statesman saying either we shouldn't be involved or it won't work or the troops should be on the line dividing the Serb and the Croat Muslim parts of the country which everyone thought would be like the Korean demilitarized zone. Well, none of it happened. No Americans were killed. No NATO forces were killed. The 20,000 US troops are down to 150 today. The 60,000 NATO troops are down to, oh, I think, 2,000 or less. The demarcation line between the two parts of Bosnia is about the same as going from Ohio to Pennsylvania. You don't slow down. There are no checkpoints. There are still a lot of problems, and I'll get to those in a moment. But the country is one country, divided into two or three administrations. <clears throat> it is an administrative mess, and there were plenty of problems at Dayton, and I'll get back to how those can hopefully be fixed in a minute. But the underlying point is that our goal was to end a war. Actually, that's a pretty good phrase. I think I might write a book called End a War. Our goal was to end a war, and by God, we did it with your help here at Dayton. And the war never resumed. The Congress voted three to one, the House, the Newt Gingrich Republican Congress voted three to one to oppose the Dayton Agreement. Um, and I mention that because it's very relevant to the current context of what's going on in Washington right now. Uh, our administration didn't accuse them of disloyalty or treason or aiding and abetting the enemy. We just fought publicly against that position. President Clinton used his commander-in-chief authority to deploy. We got UN support after the fact with the support of friends like Wolfgang Ischinger. And we just went forward. And I don't, I don't appreciate the fact that people who disagree with an administration get attacked the way they were in the last week by the administration, whether you supported Iraq or not. It's just... <laughs> when Robert Livingston opposed us violently, remember he was the man who succeeded Gingrich, we didn't accuse them of treason. We argued with them. We won people over. We took 120 members of the House of Representatives to Bosnia on trips to prove to them it mattered. We fought it out, and we turned public opinion around, and we, and we sustained the peace. Uh, now, we're all very proud of that. It was a successful agreement and achieved our objectives. And, and um, Wolfgang Ischinger was an integral part of that. It wasn't easy to be a European at Dayton for those three weeks. We, it was very, very frustrating. There was a British representative, a French representative, a German representative, Ambassador Ischinger, but there was also a European Union representative, Carl Bildt, this former Swedish Prime Minister, and the relationship between the EU senior person and the other three was complicated and confusing, but Wolfgang 
stayed the course, had his instructions from his government, carried them out beautifully under tremendously difficult uh, situation. And uh, our friendship, which predated that, was even deepened here and has continued ever since in many different guises. But at the end of that process, we moved from the agreement itself to its implementation. Now, in all the interviews I did today, there was constant questions. Was the agreement, what's wrong with the agreement? You did this, you did that, you divided the country, two week central government and so on. And I think I surprised every interviewer by agreeing with every negative criticism. I agree the agreement was deeply flawed. In 21 days, going down to the last hours of the last day, you couldn't get a perfect agreement. You just couldn't. You had to choose between an imperfect peace and a resumption of the war. And it came down to the last few hours. We went to sleep on the night of November 20th. The, the, this wonderful videotape says 20 days, but I must quibble, it was 21 days. And on the 20, 20th day, we were, we were at the wall. And around midnight, <clears throat> Izabegovic, the Bosnian president, rejected our final offer, which was 95% of what he wanted. And we went to sleep expecting failure. And the next morning, uh, but I sent three of my team, General Clark, who you will see tomorrow, Chris Hill, who is now the Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian Affairs, and, and, and as we speak in Beijing, negotiating with the North Koreans, and he calls us once in a while and says, we're going to do what we did in Dayton, lock them up. And I say, you'll never lock the North Koreans up. <laughs> and uh, one other person, we, I sent them over to Milosevic is in the middle of the night and said, this is it. We're going to close down in the morning. We told President Clinton he supported us. We woke up in the morning. We had a staff meeting. I said, you've done your best. Warren Christopher said, you've done your best. <clears throat> we wrote our failure statements, 800 journalists who had heard the rumor that we had failed <clears throat> were camped outside. And as we were meeting, uh, my wife Kati, who is here with me today, came running into the meeting and said, Milosevic is out in the, in the parking lot where it was snowing and he needs to see you right away. And um, Milosevic came in and said, OK, I will make a compromise on the last unresolved issue, which is the status of a town called Birchko on the Croatian-Bosnian border. Um, and uh, Warren Christopher and I went over to see Izabegovic and said to him, Milosevic is willing to give up his claim to Birchko and turn it over to us, and we'll decide it in 12 months. And this is it. You know, we're going to go out. We're going to go public in less than an hour. It was a long pause. Izabegovic was sitting in one of the rooms at the BOQs at Wright Pat. And um, he had his uh, Izabegovic, his foreign minister, and his prime minister, who, who, as I, you saw from the thing I quoted earlier, weren't talking to each other very much. And um, after a long pause, Izabegovic said, um, it is not a just peace. But, and then he paused, and we just didn't know where he was going to go, and he said, but my country needs peace. And just then I could see the foreign minister and the prime minister were about to jump and start arguing with them. So I said to Warren Christopher, let's get the hell out of here fast. <laughs> and we shook his hand, said, you got a deal. We ran to the phone. We called President Clinton and said, go out and announce this thing before it falls apart. <laughs> That's the last day here in Dayton, which will celebrate the 10th anniversary of Monday. The point of the story is that we knew it was an imperfect peace, but we ended the war and we got what we came for. But we left behind some unresolved problems. Now, in analyzing what happened next, you must distinguish between the agreement and its implementation, and many people don't. The number one failure of the last 10 years had nothing to do with what happened at Dayton. It is the failure to capture Radovan Karadzic and Ratko Mladic. That was authorized by Dayton, and many other war criminals were captured. But for reasons that we can't analyze and no one fully understands, we failed to capture those two men. And Karadzic could have been picked up 
right after the Dayton Agreement, when his green Mercedes-Benz was parked outside his office in Palais, easily, but the American commanding admiral, yes, we had an admiral and a land command, but that's the way the military works sometimes, simply refused to do it. And that act, which President Clinton later told me he considered an act of insubordination, allowed Carthage to slip out from under our grasp when we had him. And now, for 10 years, he's been on the run. And um, he's, in my guess, my guess is he's hiding in a monastery somewhere on the, in the eastern part of Bosnia or in Montenegro, uh, protected by paramilitary, uh, ultra-Serb nationalist uh, crooks. And, um, but that failure had nothing to do with Dayton. It was a failure of implementation. But there were mistakes in Dayton. We allowed three armies to exist in a single country because NATO didn't want to uh, integrate them. We allowed two separate police forces because this took place at the time that the, that the uh, Congress had closed down the U.S. government. You may remember November 95 was a traumatic month because the Gingrich contract with America and the tax cuts and the fight over the budget resulted in a shutdown of the U.S. government. So we didn't have the money to pay for the police and we got a bad deal on the police. The central government was too weak. We allowed three presidents in the country, a Bosnian Muslim, a Bosnian Croat, and a Bosnian Serb. The country shouldn't have three ethnically based presidents. We knew that. But the people at Dayton, the, the leaders wanted nine presidents in the Yugoslav model. And to get them down to three, as Wolfgang will remember, was a tremendous achievement. As my friend Zuzal, who was on the Croatian delegation, later became his country's foreign minister, will remember. Your president was a moderate. He only wanted seven presidents. <laughs> Whereas <laughs> Izabegovic wanted nine, right? <laughs> I'll never forget it. So getting them down to three was an achievement, but it's not right. They should only have one president. We knew that we were, we were creating a system that would not solve the, all the problems. And by the way, I need to underscore here a key point. When we say ethnic, which is a nice artful term you read in the paper all the time, what we're really talking about is racism. It's just a fancy name for racism. Racism, which by the way, is not based on any racial difference. Uh, there's no difference between Muslims, Croats, and Serbs. They, they went their different ways through the history of the last 800 years in the Balkans, but they all intermarried, they all came from the same place, and so on. And um, now, for the last 10 years, very little was done to fix those issues. A little bit under Clinton, not enough. And then for the last four years, nothing at all. And then about five months ago, uh, the new administration at the State Department in the second term uh, made a very important change in policy and one that I find very encouraging. Uh, the new Secretary of State, Condoleezza Rice, effectively reversed the policy of the last four years. Now, because she's uh, very close to President Bush and because she's very disciplined and loyal, if she were here tonight, she'd say, we didn't make any change at all. But of course, it is a major change. But uh, she, she would say there's no change while making the change. That's the essence of being a good, good political diplomat in Washington. The policy changed dramatically, and she did something that Wolfgang and I and others in this room are all very pleased with. She put the new Under Secretary of State, Nick Burns, in charge of the policy. Burns had been at Dayton as Warren Christopher's spokesman. He had been ambassador to Greece and to NATO, so he really knew the nation, the region. And he was put in charge of Balkan policy. And this combination has resulted in a dramatic change. So instead of simply celebrating what happened here 10 years ago, as those of you who've been at the symposium out at the Hope Hotel know today, there is an actual process now resumed after four years of total neglect. That process will culminate on Monday and Tuesday in Washington when the Secretary of State will spend more time on this issue than anyone has since Madeleine Albright left her job. 
Um, Condoleezza Rice will give events. Nick Burns is working very hard on this. And one of the key negotiators in all this, Don Hayes, who's worked with me in Germany, at the United Nations, and in the State Department, and was the deputy to Patty Ashdown as deputy high representative in Sarajevo, and who's here with us tonight, um, is the real battering ram who is, who is pushing hard for progress. So the military problem I mentioned earlier has already been resolved. There's military reform and a lot of integration. The police issue is moving forward. I'll leave it to Don and the Secretary of State and, the, and, and Nick Burns to work out the final details. But even if they fall short of where I think they should go, at least they have re-engaged the U.S. and the region after four years of nearly complete neglect. Had I been standing here a year ago, I would be very, very critical of the administration, not on political grounds, but simply on policy grounds. But this is not a partisan political issue. The nation benefits, and not every foreign policy issue should be the subject of partisan debate. And now that the administration is, is re-engaged in the region, something that I believe is essential for the national interests of the U.S. and for U.S.-European relations, now that they're working closely again with people like Wolfgang Ischinger, uh, I, am, I am personally very pleased about it. And so we will see next week what, um, what comes out of the Secretary of State and Nick Burns and Don Hayes' efforts, uh, supported very heavily, I might add, and I would emphasize, by the European Union. But I want to leave you with this point. Not until the U.S. re-engaged, going back to what Ambassador Nishinger said about the United States role, not until the U.S. re-engaged in roughly May, April, May of this year, was any movement going on. This is, I, I don't say this because I'm criticizing the Europeans the way you often hear in Washington. This is just a fact of life that Wolfgang and I have talked about many, many times. The U.S. needs to be engaged in certain parts of the world where it has a special role to play, not as a unilateral force, but as a partner taking a lead. And when the U.S. told the Europeans and the United Nations that we were going to re-engage in the Balkans, and by the way, I want to stress that Burns' job includes Kosovo, and what has to happen in Kosovo is going to be far, far more difficult than what we're talking about today because the status of Kosovo is completely unresolved and there's, it's going to be a brutal negotiation. And the, Euro, the United Nations has appointed Mati Artasari, the, old, the former Finnish president, to negotiate. And the U.S. is about to appoint a senior negotiator to assist him, and that's going to be brutal. But in both cases, Bosnia and Kosovo, when we finally re-engaged, everyone else started to move. And in this case, the re-engagement wasn't unilateral. So the, Standard criticism of the Bush administration regarding Iraq and other parts of the world simply doesn't apply in this area anymore. And I think that's a very good thing. And I'm very pleased to see it. And the conference you're having here now is a perfect scene setter because everything you're doing here through Don Hayes and Patty Ashdown and Wolfgang Ischinger, who's without question the most popular ambassador in Washington, the Atlantic Corps, and also the best German ambassador in the least the last 40 years. I've known most of Thank you again for this uh, fantastic award <clears throat> for something that really does exist in my mind, the spirit of Dayton. And I urge you to continue to keep the special feeling that this wonderful small American city uh, is, it represents. Dayton, of course, is now a shorthand word for a certain kind of negotiation. But it also, to me, represents a certain unique quality about the American spirit at its very best. And in that, in that, um, context. I thank you again from the bottom of my heart for what you've honored me and Kati with this evening. Thank you.